Hi, and welcome to this Synapse video series on eCentric training. I'm really glad that you decided to join, and I'm very excited to share this information with you. We're going to cover a lot of ground around eCentric training, and specifically eCentric overload training. We'll go over some of the physiology behind it and some of the vast benefits that it offers, as well as some of the challenges in, in implementing it. Um, so I hope you stick with me. Now, uh, again, if you're here, you either have a Synapse, you're interested in Synapse, or maybe you're not even interested in Synapse at all. That's all fine. We're going to go over this information, and hopefully it'll uh, bring some light to the way you think about training, and maybe find a way to start incorporating eccentric training into your own training regimen, uh, whether you be uh, an elite athlete or uh, you know a weekend warrior, as they say. Uh, whatever it is, I think sort of we've come to the conclusion that everybody's an athlete in their own right, depending on what they're doing during their life. So um, let's get started. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, before we get too deep into it, I just want to tell you how I got here. Uh, my background is in professional tennis. Uh, I had the distinct privilege of working with WTA tour champions and Grand Slam champions on the tennis tour uh, on the women's side. And my responsibilities were tennis coaching and as well as the physical conditioning and strength conditioning for my athletes to prepare them for the season and work them through the, the, all the way through the season and perform at high levels. Um, so just like all coaches and probably much like yourselves, we're always looking for ways to improve upon uh, the training methods that we have now. How do we find that extra bit of juice that can take our athlete to the next level or our own performance uh, into another stratosphere? So I was looking at a bunch of different research studies at the time, and I kept stumbling across eccentric overload training. Now, it boasted all kinds of benefits, and I want to run through a few of those here just so we get some, just a, a broad picture with some broad strokes around what those benefits are. So some really imp um, impressive results as far as improving athleticism and some real world stuff like changing direction. So almost every sport, if you can change direction better, you're going to excel at your sport. Um, improvements in vertical jump, which is often you know one of the testers of, of how well someone can perform athletically. Um, strength gains in less time, so consolidating the amount of time needed for, for strength training uh, frees up time for athletes, and that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, increased flexibility. Now, normally when we talk about strength training, uh, that and flexibility sometimes uh, are on two different paths. So you, you do your strength training, and then you have to do your flexibility training to sort of uh, offset the contractions that you're doing in that strength training. And Eccentric overload training has actually been shown to, to be better than stretching protocols at lengthening muscles and increasing ranges of motion. So while you're getting stronger, you're actually increasing flexibility, which was quite exciting. Um, greater connective tissue resilience uh, for uh, your tendons and ligaments. Because eccentric overload exposes you to higher loads, it prepares your body better for what's going to happen on the field. And so if you can do that, the chances of injury start to go down in addition to the strength gains and the flexibility gains. So injury prevention was another huge thing that sort of uh, got me excited about the concept of eccentric overload training. Um, eccentric overload training has also been shown to specifically target type 2B muscle fibers. Now, if you're not familiar with that, your type 2B muscle fibers are sort of your fast twitch muscle fibers. They're, they're responsible for your explosive movements, sprinting, any of the plyometric type movements. And that comes in handy for athletes to be able to target those muscles specifically. Um, force absorption and deceleration, being able to, you know, massive forces are being used uh, throughout these athletic endeavors. So being able to absorb those forces, oftentimes the eccentric phase of movement is when injuries occur. So if you're better at catching those forces, uh, your chances of reducing injury start to be better. So you can compete for the whole season through without, without those injuries and those niggly uh, aches and pains. Um, there's a bunch of horbo hormonal benefits to eccentric overload training. You get growth hormone, insulin resistance is positively impacted, and there's a bunch of other blood markers that actually react very, very well and favor favorably to eccentric overload training. Um, increased bone density, improved coordination, improved balance. So you can see there's a really long list of things that uh, can be impacted with this type of training. And as you can imagine, after seeing this list, 
I was more than eager to start my athletes on this type of training. Um, so when I started to get into it, I did realize that unfortunately there is a catch and there are some real challenges associated with implementing eccentric overload training. So before we can get to that catch and why it's difficult to do this type of exercise, we need to take a few minutes and define some terminology and understand that we're all on the same page as far as terminology and some basic physiology around how the body actually works. So let's take a look at a quick video that explains the three phases of movement and then we'll come back and discuss it. In any form of training, there are three phases of movement, each with varying abilities to generate force. The concentric phase occurs when a muscle is contracting while shortening. As the hand rises to the mid-range of the movement, the ability to generate force increases, as depicted by the graph with the red line. When the hand approaches the end of the phase, the muscle potential decreases as fibers in the muscle overlap. The concentric phase is responsible for initiating movement and accelerating. Real-world examples include walking up the stairs or starting a sprint. The isometric phase takes place when the muscle fibers are contracting while holding position without shortening or lengthening. Typically this occurs at the top and the bottom of movements, however it is engaged any time the resistance is held motionless. And finally, the eccentric phase, often referred to as the negative, occurs when the muscle fibers are lengthening while still contracting. As the hand lowers the resistance, supportive structures are engaged and the muscle is capable of generating substantially more force, anywhere from 30 to 75% greater than in the concentric phase. The eccentric phase is responsible for absorbing forces when decelerating momentum to slow down or stop. Examples range from walking down the stairs to an aggressive change of direction in sports. Numerous studies have shown that training the eccentric phase of movement is extremely effective at building strength, preventing injury, and rehabilitation. So we just learned that the eccentric phase of movement can generate substantially more force in the concentric phase, anywhere from 1.3 to 1.75 times the amount of force. But what does that actually mean in the real world? So if we take the example of lifting a 100 pound weight overhead, during the concentric phase, I lift the weight above my head. But during the eccentric phase, I would be capable of generating far more force, anywhere from 130 pounds to 175 pounds of force. So that brings us to the distinction between eccentric and eccentric overload training. So oftentimes in the physical therapy world or the strength and conditioning world or fitness world, they refer to eccentric training in this example as lifting the 100 pounds upwards and then slowly lowering the weight down on the eccentric phase of movement. So you have a slower cadence on the eccentric phase of movement. And what that does is puts the, the muscle under tension for a longer period of time. And there's value to that, but that's distinct from eccentric overload training. So in this example, eccentric overload training would be lifting the 100 pounds up and then having a weight or force that pulls my hand down against my will greater than my force production capability. So in this example, we said between 130 to 175 pounds. So it would be slightly greater than that. So somewhere in the ballpark of 170 pounds, pushing me down against my will, even though I'm resisting it. That's eccentric overload, and that's what reaps the benefits that we spoke about earlier in this video. I'm here today with Joe Kravis, former WTA champion, 2008 Olympian, and US Fed Cup team member, and she's here to help illustrate some key points about eccentric training. Thanks for being here, Joe. My pleasure. So an important point about the eccentric phase of movement is that all humans are much stronger, anywhere from 130 to 170% stronger in their eccentric phase of movement. That makes it really difficult with traditional weights to challenge that properly. Jill's going to demonstrate with us, we've got a weight that's 30 pounds here. Tell us a little bit about it. So I'm going to do an overhead press and 30 pounds is just outside my one rep max. So she's going to give it a go. She's pressing up with all her might and I'll spot her. Unfortunately, that's just above her capabilities of lifting. However, if we put her at the top of the movement and let her go through the eccentric phase of movement, she's able to lower that under control while I spot her. Amazing job, great. And then she can actually do reps with that weight while being spotted. So, 
Here's a weight that she couldn't lift, but she's able to lower that under control for reps. So even if you had a personal spotter for every single rep, traditional weights fail to fully stimulate the eccentric phase of movement. And in fact, it's dangerous to even attempt it. So eccentric overload training, now we can discuss the catch around doing it and actually engaging in it. It's twofold. One is the practicality of it. We, it's very difficult to lift a hundred pound weight and then add 30 to 75 pounds to it as we lower it and then lift again. That's very, very difficult to pull off unless you have machines that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, on top of that, you with that much load, by definition, the person exercising can't lift it. They can lower it, but they can't lift it. So you need spotters in place to make sure that there's some modicum of safety around that. But even if you can take care of the practicality issues and the safety issues, you're still dealing with a fairly dangerous situation. I was not willing, no matter how much I wanted the benefits of eccentric overload training, I wasn't willing to put my athletes in the kind of danger where if anything went wrong, that could end in a substantial injury that could put them you know, out of competition for potentially a long period of time. So that was how the synapse evolved was how do I get the benefits of eccentric overload training without the risks? So over time it was developed and tomorrow we're going to take a look at how it compares to conventional equipment and how it does go beyond those limitations to allow for eccentric overload training in a really, really safe manner so that we can unlock all of those benefits that we talked about earlier in this video. So I've enjoyed today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Maybe uh, it's given you some information and some food for thought. Um, I look forward to catching up with you tomorrow and we're going to build on this conversation and look at some interesting aspects of eccentric overload training further. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then and thanks for joining me today.